It's been one of the hottest summers on record. While the heat and the wildfires can't be directly attributed to climate change, no single weather event can, the scientific consensus is that the world is warming and humans are to blame. But the authors of this latest report say things could get a lot worse. They studied natural processes they believe could be at tipping point, including the reduction in sea ice, Amazon rainforest dieback and thawing of the Siberian permafrost. Beyond a threshold, they claim these processes could lead to irreversible global warming and sea level rise. The problem is, they say that's probably already inevitable. De Paris pour le est the Paris Climate Agreement pledged to limit the increase in global temperatures to two degrees this century. But the authors of this report say even if this target is met, there is a risk we will enter the hothouse Earth spiral. Privately, many climate scientists believe the battle is now to keep within three degrees, but it will still require changes on a vast scale. The end of fossil fuel use, reforestation, and perhaps geoengineering projects to remove carbon from the air. This graphic shows the increase in global temperatures since records began in 1850. If you take it as a warning, the question is, what do you do about it? Well, joining me now from Stockholm is Johan Rockström, a professor in environmental science at Stockholm University and co-author of the new report. Also, Tessa Kahn, co-director of the Climate Litigation Network, joins us from Brussels. Professor Rockström, what do we do about the warnings in your report? Or are you saying it's effectively too late? Well, this is a summary of the state of science as, as of today. And it indicates and shows very clearly that so far the planet remains resilient and is able to buffer and continue cooling as, uh, as it has been doing for the past 12,000 years since we left the last ice age. What we are seeing is cracks in this capacity of buffering and cooling the planet. So it's not as if we are at one degree warming in an immediate irreversible tipping point, but we're starting to see the first scientific evidence that we can define quantitatively where a planetary threshold lies. And our estimate is that it is at, at two degrees Celsius. So the window is still open to be able to transition into a safe operating space, but barely. Well, we have the Paris Climate Agreement. Are you saying governments need to go beyond that? Well, if you read the climate agreement very carefully, it says stay well below two degrees Celsius and aim for 1.5. This paper lends very strong scientific support for exactly that text, aim for 1.5, avoid two degrees Celsius, because approaching two degrees Celsius can take us into very dangerous terrain. And this is based, you know, also looking back, over the past one million years, the planet has been swinging, you know, harmoniously and naturally in and out of ice ages and interglacials. And we now know from these seven, eight interglacials that we've been passing through, that current temperatures on Earth where we have contributed to one degree Celsius rise, is at the edge of the maximum temperature in these interglacials. So we're right at the edge and should not go further. Tessa Khan, um, you, you used a sort of a novel way of levering governments into doing the right thing. Just explain what it is you're doing and what, what you think the potential is for that. Sure, well, we support cases against national governments to hold governments accountable for the commitments that they've made, for example, in the Paris Agreement, to keep climate change to below a certain threshold um, and to ensure that they fulfil the duties that they have to their citizens to protect them from imminent and foreseeable harm. And we've seen that that strategy um, has enormous potential. There was a groundbreaking case uh, that, was, uh, that, that was resolved in 2015 against the Dutch government um, in which a district court in The Hague held that the government had to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by a certain percentage by 2020, which was a significant reduction compared to the trajectory that the government um, was on at that point. So litigation against governments is, I think, a very powerful tool for making sure that they're held accountable for the promises and the commitments that they've been making for years now under international climate agreements to avert dangerous climate change. How's that going to work in China? 
Well, um, you know, it does depend um, on the country in question and the judiciary in question, but there is a surge in national level cases against governments and every government has their part to play in stopping climate change and ensuring that their countries um, reduce emissions in accordance with their responsibilities under the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement institutionalises an approach whereby every country takes responsibility for their contribution to the climate crisis. So there oh. are currently at least six or seven cases on foot against national governments in Europe. There's a very significant case that's going to be heard in October against the Trump administration in the US. Um, and I think it's a strategy that's just beginning to gain steam globally. Professor Rockstrom, there's been a lot of talk today about horrific rises in, uh, in, in sea levels of, of, of tidal waves, you know, sort of horrific doomsday scenarios. Do you think that works as a way of moving public opinion? Well, I think it's not a question of whether it works or not. I think it simply is necessary. We have to put all the cards on the table of the facts we know. And given that we now have come so far in our scientific understanding of the global risks, which took which could take us to potential catastrophic risks, we need to actually inform our citizenship that this is the reality and therefore translate that not to depression and denial, but to action and transformative change. And I'm absolutely convinced that today, uh, you know, humanity can stand the, the, the dire facts, given that we have so much evidence that the solutions are at hand, solutions that can not only decarbonize the world energy system and get us on a trajectory below the two degrees Celsius planetary limit, but also benefit us health-wise, security-wise, equity-wise, and economically. So, so you know, there is, a, there is a reason why this tipping point now is not only biophysical, but also social. Uh, Tessa Khan, I mean, are, are these facts or projections? That's what a lot of people struggle with. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, so, well, the professor was just talking about, you know, putting cards on the table and that these are the facts that people have got to okay. get their heads around. Are these facts or are these right. projections which could be wrong? Well, I mean, that's one of the great things about going to court is that you're held to a certain standard of proof. So you can't just rely on misinformation or estimates that aren't rigorous. Um, courts put facts on the record and we've seen in the past that, for example, in the Dutch climate case, that the court accepted the scientific conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which um, really represents the climate science related research of, of hundreds of scientists around the globe. And I think one of the advantages of litigation is that it does show the frightening degree of consensus around some of these projections and facts. Tessa Khan and Johan Rockström, thank you both very much.